This is part one of Monster by Walter Keane Myers. The dedication is to John Brendel for his long friendship. The best time to cry is at night. The lights are out and someone is being beaten up and screaming for help. That way, even if you sniffle a little, they won't hear you. If anybody knows that you are crying, they'll start talking about it, and soon it'll be your turn to get beat up when the lights go out. There's a mirror over the steel sink in my cell. It's six inches high and scratched with the name of some guys who were here before me. When I look into the small rectangle, I see a face looking back at me, but I don't recognize it. It doesn't look like me. I couldn't have changed that much in a few months. I wonder if I'll look like myself when the trial is over. This morning at breakfast, a guy got hit in the face with a tray. Somebody said some little thing and somebody else got mad. There was blood all over the place. When the guards came over, they made us line up against the wall. The guy who was hit, they made sit at the table where they waited for another guard to bring them rubber gloves. When the gloves came, the guards put them on, handcuffed the guy, and then took him to this dispensary. He was still bleeding pretty bad. I say you get used to being in jail, but I don't see how. Every morning I wake up and I am surprised to be here. If your life outside was real, then everything in here is just the opposite. We sleep with strangers, wake up with strangers, and go to the bathroom in front of strangers. They're strangers, but they still find reasons to hurt each other. Sometimes I feel like, okay, I've walked into the middle of a movie. It is a strange movie, with no plot and no beginning. The movie is in black and white and grainy. Sometimes the camera moves in so close that you can't tell what is going on, and you just listen to the sounds and guess. I have seen movies of prisons, but never one like this. This is not a movie. Monday, July 6th, Monster. Fade in, interior, early morning in cell block D, Manhattan Detention Center. Camera goes slowly down grim, gray corridor. There are sounds of inmates yelling from cell to cell. Much of it is obscene. Most of the voices are clearly black or Hispanic. Camera stops and slowly turns toward a cell. Interior, cell. 16-year-old Steve Foreman is sitting on the edge of a metal cot, head in hands. He is thin, brown-skinned. On the cot next to him are the suit and tie he is to wear to court for the start of his trial. Cut to Ernie, another prisoner, sitting on John, pants down. Cut to Sunset, another prisoner, pulling on T-shirt. Cut to Steve, pulling blanket over his head. The screen goes dark. Voiceover, VO. Ain't no use putting the blanket over your head, man. You can't cut this out. This is reality. This is the real deal. VO continues with anonymous prisoner explaining how the detention center is the real thing. As he does, words appear on the screen, just like the opening credits of the movie Star Wars, rolling from the bottom of the screen and shrinking until they are a blur on on the top of the screen before rolling off into space. Monster, the story of my miserable life. Starring Steve Harmon, produced by Steve Harmon, directed by Steve Harmon. Credits continue a roll. Excuse me, credits continue to roll. The incredible story of how one guy's life was turned around by a few events and how he might spend the rest of his life behind bars. Told as it actually happened. Written and directed by Steve Harmon, featuring Sandra Petrocelli as the dedicated prosecutor. Kathy O'Brien as the defense attorney with doubts. James King as the thug. Richard Bobo Evans as the rat. Osvaldo Cruz, member of the Diablos, as the tough guy wannabe. Morel Henry as the witness. Jose Delgado, who found the body. And starring 16-year-old Steve Harmon as the boy on trial for murder. Filmed at the Manhattan Detention Center. Set design, handcuffs, and prison outfits by the state of New York. Vio. Yo, Harmon, you gonna eat breakfast? 
I'm gonna get your breakfast, man. I'll take your eggs if you don't want them. You want them? Steve, subdued. I'm not hungry. Sunset. His trial starts today. He up for the big one. I know how that feels. Cut to interior. Corrections department van. To the bars at the rear of the van, we see people going about the business of their lives in downtown New York. There are men collecting garbage, a female traffic officer motioning for a taxi to make a turn, students on the way to school. Few people notice the van as it makes its way from the detention center to the courthouse. Cut two prisoners, handcuffed, coming from back of van. Steve is carrying a notebook. He is dressed in the suit and tie we saw on the cot. He is seen only briefly as he is herded through the heavy doors of the courthouse. Fade out. At last, prisoner from the van enters rear of courthouse. Fade in. Interior courthouse. We're in a small room used for protective, excuse me, used for prisoner lawyer interviews. A guard sits at the desk behind Steve. Kathy O'Brien, Steve's lawyer, is petite, red-haired, and freckled. She is all business as she talks with Steve. Let me make sure you understand what's going on. Both you and this King character are on trial for felony murder. Felony murder is as serious as it gets. Sandra Petrocelli is the prosecutor, and she's good. They're pushing for the death penalty, which is really bad. Drew might think they're doing you a big favor by giving you life in prison. So you'd better take this trial very, very seriously. When you're in court, you sit there and you pay attention. You let the jury know that you think the case is as serious as they do. You don't turn and wave to any of your friends. It's all right to acknowledge your mother. I have to go and talk to the judge. The trial will begin in a few minutes. Is there anything you want to ask me before it starts? Steve. You think we're going to win? O'Brien. Seriously. It probably depends on what you mean by win. Cut to interior holding room. We, st we see Steve sitting at one end of the bench against the opposite wall dressed in a sloppy looking suit is 23 year old James King, the other man on trial. King looks older than 23. He looks over at Steve with a hard look and we see Steve look away. Two guards sit at a table away from the prisoners who are handcuffed. The camera finds the guards in a medium shot, MS. At the breakfast, an aluminum takeout tray that contain eggs, sausages, and potatoes. A black female stenographer pours coffee for herself and the guards. Stenographer, I hope this case lasts two weeks. I can sure use the money. Guard one, six days, maybe seven. It's a motion case. They go through the motions, then they lock them up. Turns and looks off camera towards Steve. Ain't that right, bright eyes? Cut to Steve, who is seated on a low bench. He is handcuffed to a U-bolt put in a bench for that purpose. He looks away from the guard. Cut to door. It opens, and court clerk looks in. Court clerk. Two minutes. Cut to guards who hurriedly finish breakfast. Stenographer takes machine into courtroom. They unshackle Steve and take him to a door. Cut to Steve is made to sit down at one table. At another table, we see King and two attorneys. Steve sits alone. A guard stands behind him. There are one or two spectators in the court, then four more enter. Close up of Steve Harmon, the fear is evident on his face. MS, people are getting ready for the trial to begin. Kathy O'Brien sits next to Steve. O'Brien, how are you doing? Steve, I'm scared. O'Brien, good, you should be. Anyway, just remember what we've been talking about. The judge is going to rule on a motion that King's lawyer made to suppress Cruz's testimony and a few other things. Steve, let me tell you what my job is here. My job is to make sure the law works for you as well as against you and to make you a human being in the eyes of the jury. Your job is to help me. Any questions you have, write them down and I'll try to answer them. What are you doing there? Steve. I'm writing this whole thing down as a movie. O'Brien, whatever. Make sure you pay attention. Close attention. P.O., the court guard. All rise. The judge enters and sits behind bench. He is tall and thin. He pushes his fingers through wisps of white hair and looks over the courtroom before sitting. He's a 60-year-old New York judge and already looks bored with the case. The court guard signals for people to visit. Judge. Prosecution ready? Sandra Petrocelli, the prosecutor, stands. She is dressed in a gray business suit. 
looks intense while still being attractive. Her hair and eyes are dark. Petricelli, ready, Your Honor. Judge, defense. Asa Briggs, the lead counsel for the defense of James King, stands. He is dressed in a dark blue suit and a light blue tie. His eyes are also blue and his hair is white. Briggs, ready. O'Brien, <coughs> excuse me. O'Brien, ready, Your Honor. Judge, all right. I'm ruling the kid's testimony is admissible. You can bring up your motions relative to that ruling this afternoon or if there's a break. Hope everyone had a good 4th of July. Briggs, the usual barbecue and a softball game that reminded me that I can't run anymore. O'Brien, with all the fireworks, it's my least favorite holiday. Judge, bring in the jury. Cut to film workshop at Stuyvesant High School. A film on a small screen is just ending. It's a class project and the camera is shaky. We watch as a girl on the screen walks slowly away. The screen goes black, then dazzling white, then normal as lights go on. We see Mr. Sawicki, film club mentor, and nine students who are casually dressed. Sawicki. In a jury competition, the ending would have hurt this piece, but otherwise it was interesting. Any comments? We see Steve raising his hand, looking much the same as he does in court. Steve. I like the ending. Wiki, I didn't say it was bad, but wasn't it predictable? You need to predict without predicting. You know what I mean? When you make a film, you leave an impression on the viewers who serve as a kind of jury for your film. If you make your film predictable, they'll make up their minds about it long before it's over. Cut to courtroom. We see, we see the jurors filing in and taking their seats. Steve to attorney. Think they look all right? O'Brien, they're what we have for a jury. We have to deal with them. Cut to long shot of Petricelli. She stands at the podium in front of the jury. She smiles at the jurors, and some smile back. Petricelli, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Petricelli, and I'm an assistant district attorney for the state of New York. I'm representing the people in this matter, which you were informed during jury selection is a case of felony murder. We're here today basically because this is not a perfect world. The founding fathers of our country understood this. They knew that there would be times and circumstances during which our society would be threatened by the acts of individuals. This is one of those times. A citizen of our city, a citizen of our state and country, has been killed by people who attempted to rob him. To safeguard our society, a system of laws has been created. You, the jury, are part of this system of laws. I represent the state of New York, and I am part of that system, as are the judge and all the participants in this trial. I will do my best to bring you the facts of this case, and I know you will do your best to judge the merits of the case. Most people in our community are decent, hardworking citizens who pursue their own interests legally and without infringing on the rights of others. But there are also monsters in our communities, people who are willing to steal and to kill, people who disregard the rights of others. On the 22nd of December of last year, at approximately 4 o'clock in the afternoon, two men entered a drugstore on 145th Street in Harlem. The state will contend that one of those men was Richard Bobo Evans. The state will contend that the other man who entered the store at that time, who participated in the robbery and the murder, was James King. Petricelli points to the table at which James King sits. Mr. King is the man sitting at that table who is wearing a brown suit and is sitting at the right of the table. You are introduced to him during the jury selection process. He is one of the men on trial here today. The purpose of the two men entering the store on that Monday was very simple. They were going to rob the owner, 55-year-old Aguinaldo Nesbitt. We will show that although the two men did not have a gun with them, the owner of the store did have a gun for which he had a license and produced it to defend his property. Mr. Evans, who participated in the robbery, will testify that there was a struggle which resulted in the gun being discharged and Mr. Nesbitt being killed. Mr. Nesbitt had every right to defend his property, every right not to be robbed. We all have that right. Further, there will be evidence that prior to the robbery there was a plan a conspiracy to rob the store. 
Mr. Evans and Mr. King were to enter the store and do the actual robbery. Another of the planners of this crime was to stand outside the drugstore and impede anyone chasing the robbers. The young man who had the assignment will testify to his role in the affair. Yet another of the conspirators, the planners of this robbery that left the man dead, was to go into the store prior to the robbery to check it out, to make sure there were no police in the store, to make sure that the coast was clear, as they say. Two of the conspirators will testify to their understanding of this fact. The man who was to enter the store and check it out is sitting at the other table. His name is Stephen Harmon. Cut to Steve Harmon. Then, see you, close-up of the pad in front of him. He is writing the word monster over and over again. The white hand, O'Brien's, takes the pencil from his hand and crosses out all the monsters. O'Brien, whispering, you have to believe in yourself if we're going to convince a jury that you're innocent. Cut to MS of Petrocelli. Petrocelli, a medical examiner, will testify to the cause of death, showing that the gunshot wound was fatal. Even though it was Mr. Nesbitt's gun, it was not Mr. Nesbitt who caused his own death. This was no suicide. This death was a direct result of the robbery. Very simply put, this is a case of murder. It is, moreover, a murder committed during a felonious act. The two defendants you see before you will be you will be shown to be participants in that act and are being charged with felony murder. Later, the judge will give you instructions on how to consider the evidence presented. There is no doubt in my mind, and I believe by the end of the trial there will be little doubt in yours, that these two men, James King and Stephen Harmon, were all part of the robbery that caused the death of Alvinaldo Nesbitt. Thank you. Cut to long shot of courtroom. O'Brien is at attorney's podium. Cut to Steve's mother on wooden bench in the gallery area, listening intently. Her face looked worried. O'Brien, the state correctly says that the laws of a society provide protection for its citizens. When a crime is committed, it is the state that must apply the law in a manner that offers redress and that brings the guilty parties to justice. But the laws also protect the accused, and that is the wonder and beauty of the American justice system of justice. We don't drag people out of their beds in the middle of the night and lynch them. We don't torture people. We don't beat them. We apply the law equally to both sides. The law that protects society protects all of society. In this case, we will show that the evidence the state will produce is seriously flawed. We will show not only that there is room for reasonable doubt, and you will hear more about that idea at the end of this trial, but that the doubt that Steve Harmon has committed any crime, any crime at all, is overwhelming. As Mr. Herman's attorney, all I ask of you, the jury, is that you look at Steve Herman now and remember that at this moment the American system of justice demands that you consider him innocent. He is innocent until proven guilty. If you consider him innocent now, and by law you must, if you have not prejudged him, then I don't believe we will have a problem convincing you that nothing the state will produce will challenge that innocence. Thank you. Cut to Briggs. Briggs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asa Briggs, and I will be defending Mr. King. Ms. Petrocelli, representing the state, has presented this case in very broad and grandiose terms. But you will soon see that our key witnesses are among the most self-serving, heartless people imaginable. Some of them will begin their testimony by swearing that they are criminals. You have the unpleasant task of listening to people who have committed crimes, who have lied and stolen, and at least one instance has been an admitted, and let me emphasize this, an admitted accomplice to murder. But in the end, you have the opportunity to judge the state's key witnesses and to deliver a just verdict. What I am asking you to do is just that, judge what they bring up on the witness stand, and then deliver your just verdict. Thank you. Cut to witness stand. Jose Delgado is on the stand. He is young, very well built, and articulate. Jose, I'm on until 9. The store closes at 9. In the afternoon, I either go home and grab a bite or go out for Chinese. That night, I went out for Chinese. Usually, I get something and eat it in the back. When I went out, everything was okay. Petrocelli, what time did you leave the drugstore? Jose, 4.30, maybe 4.35 at the latest. Petrocelli, and what did you discover on your return? Jose, 
At first, I didn't see anything, which I knew was weird because Mr. Nevitt wouldn't leave the place empty. I went around behind the counter, and I saw Mr. Nevitt on the floor. There was blood everywhere, and the cash register was open. A lot of cigarettes were missing, too, maybe five cartons. Petricelli, did you call the police? Jose, yeah, but I knew Mr. Nesbitt was dead. Petricelli, Mr. Delgado, are you familiar with the so-called martial arts? Jose, that's my hobby. I have a black belt in karate. Petricelli, is that fact pretty well known in the neighborhood in which the drugstore operated? Jose, yeah, because whenever I was in a match and it made the papers, Mr. Nesbitt used to put the paper in the window. Petricelli, did police ever visit the drugstore? Jose, sometimes they would come in and sneak a smoke. Petricelli, nothing further. Briggs, you state that five cartons of cigarettes were missing. Jose, that's right. Briggs, five, not six? Jose, afterward I checked the inventory. It was fine. Briggs, what medical school did you attend? Jose, none. Briggs, you said you knew that Mr. Nesbitt was dead. You were sure of it. Is that right? Jose, pretty sure. Briggs, sure enough to stop and do inventory before trying to help your boss? Jose, I didn't take inventory right away. I just noticed. If you work in a store, you notice if something is missing. Briggs, how long did it take? Jose, pissed. I don't remember. Briggs, nothing further. O'Brien, no questions. Petricelli, as Jose steps down. The state calls Salvatore Zinzi. Cut to Sal Zinzi on the stand. He is nervous, slightly overweight. He wears thick glasses, which he touches over and over again as he testifies. Petricelli, Mr. Zinzi, where were you when you first became involved with this case? Zinzi, Rikers Island. It's a famous prison. Petricelli, why were you there? Zinzi, Stolen property. The guy sold me some baseball cards. They were stolen. Petricelli, you knew they were stolen? Zinzi, yeah, I guess. Petricelli, well, you were at Rikers Island. Did you engage in a certain conversation with a Wendell Bolden? Zinzi, yes, ma'am. Petricelli, you want to tell me about the conversation? Zinzi, he said he knew about a drugstore hold up where a guy was killed, and he was thinking of turning the guy in to get a break. Petricelli, and what did you do as a result of this conversation? Zinzi, I called Detective Gluck and told him what I knew. Petricelli, because you wanted to break too, is that right? Zinzi, yeah. Petricelli, so Bolden told you he knew about the crime. Was there anything else? Zinzi, that was it. Petricelli, did he tell you about some cigarettes? Zinzi, yeah, he... Briggs, objection, she's leading. Petricelli, withdrawn. What else did he tell you? Zinzi... Did he got some cigarettes from this guy? Two cartons. Petricelli, did he tell you the name of the person he got the cigarettes from? No, just that he was sure the guy was involved in the holdup. Petricelli, nothing further. Cut two, Briggs at the po podium. You wanted a break, Mr. Zinzi. Why did you need a break? You only had a few months to do, isn't that right? Zinzi, some guys were sexually harassing me, sir. Briggs, sexually harassing? Are they calling you a sissy? What does sexually harassing What does sexually harass mean to you? Zinzi, they wanted to have sex with me. Briggs, so to save yourself from being gang raped, is that what they wanted to do to you? Zinzi, yeah. Briggs, and you're afraid? Zinzi, yeah. Briggs, you're afraid and you would have said just about anything to get out of that situation. Isn't that right? Zinzi, I guess so. Briggs, would you lie? Zinzi, no. Let me get this straight, Mr. Zinzi. You'd buy stolen goods for profit, rat on somebody to save your own hide, but you're too good to lie. Is that right? Zinzi, I'm not lying now. Briggs, as a matter of fact, this Bolton was going to see what he could get out of this. But you stole his chance, too, didn't you? Zinzi, I guess. Briggs, no further questions. O'Brien, Mr. Zinzi, how long were you in jail? Zinzi, 43 days. O'Brien, do people in jail look for stories to report to the police? Petricelli, calmly, objection, that question's too vague. O'Brien, well, let me put it this way, Mr. Zinzi. This Mr. Bolden was going to use this story for his own benefit, is that right? 
Lindsay, right. O'Brien, and you decided to use it for your benefit? Lindsay, right. Lots of guys in jail do that. You use stories and you use people, right? Lindsay, sometimes. In the outcome of your talking with the detective in question, is that you were able to reach the district attorney's office and strike a deal, isn't that right? You were able to strike a deal that got you out of jail early, isn't that right? Lindsay, that's right. O'Brien, you happy with the deal? Lindsay, yeah. O'Brien, nothing further. Epicelli, Mr. Zinzi, do you know when you're lying and when you're telling the truth? Zinzi, yes, sure. Epicelli, you telling the truth now? Zinzi, yeah. Epicelli, nothing further. Flashback of 12-year-old Steve walking in a neighborhood park with his friend, Tony. Tony, they should let me pitch. I can throw straight as anything. Scoops up a rock. See the lamppost? Throws rock. We see that it bounces in front of the post and careens slightly to one side. Steve, you can't throw. Picks up rock and throws it. We see it sail past the post and hit a young woman. Tough guy she is walking with turns and sees two young boys. Tough guy. Hey man, who threw that rock? He approaches. Steve. Tony, run. Tony, taking a tentative step. What? Tough guy punches Tony. Tony falls. Tough guy stands over Tony as Steve backs off. Young woman pulls tough guy away and they leave. Tony and Steve are left in the park with Tony sitting on the ground. Tony, I didn't throw that rock. You threw it. Steve, I didn't say you threw it. I just said run. You should have run. Tony, I'll get me an Uzi and I'll blow his brains out. The end of part one.